at some point in your army career, in fact, probably multiple times during your army career, you are going to go to what is known infamously as the field. What's up, my friends? Welcome to an all new video. In this one, we're talking about the dreaded field, the field, however you want to talk about it, bivouac, FTX, sticks, all sorts of names for this thing. Maybe you've heard it from other veterans, maybe you've heard it from some of my videos or somebody else's videos, but let's talk about what the field is and what you're gonna be doing most likely. Now, before we dive into this video, if you're not already subscribed to the channel, maybe go ahead and click on that button right now. Also enable that bell so you get notified as soon as new videos go live to include the live streams and become a part of the awesome notification platoon. Let's get into it. So let's talk about the field. Now the field is training. There's a lot of different names for it. Sometimes you're coming up on company sticks. Sometimes you're coming up on an FTX. There's all sorts of things. Sometimes the operation such and such, or whatever they want to call it. But going to the field is doing army training to kind of train as if you were in a combat zone. You will do this quite often throughout your army career. There are going to be many, many times that units have to do this, right? You have to stay up to date on how to operate in your MOS in a combat environment, how to operate as a unit in a combat environment. So you're gonna to go to the field multiple times per year. Sometimes it's just right there at your duty station. Sometimes you're gonna go somewhere else like the National Training Center or Fort Polk for JRTC. And if you wanna know about NTC, I have a video that I'll link down in the description down below that kind of explains what NTC is like so you can kind of you know get familiarized with that. But a lot of times you're just doing the training right there on the installation that you're at, whether it's Fort Carson, Fort Hood, Fort Riley, whatever you're stationed at, they have a dedicated training area for you to utilize during these training exercises. Fort Carson, Fort Hood is really huge. In fact, I think Fort Hood has the largest, well, maybe the National Training Center probably is the largest, but Fort Hood has, had a pretty, has a pretty big one, as well as Fort Carson, Fort Riley. All of them have you know, a good size area for you to be able to utilize for training, either for you know, live gunneries or for setting up tents and doing these FTXs, these field problems, to be able to operate in those areas. They're also large so that you have these roads to travel down so you can do these convoy patrols or you can do maneuver you know, things with like tanks and Bradleys and whatever else you may have for your unit, whether it's an infantry unit or a cav unit or an armor unit, whatever the case is, you wanna have a large training area to be able to execute as if you were in a combat zone. So when you're doing this, you're obviously playing the US soldiers, you're playing the good guys, and then there's probably someone either from your unit or from another unit that's usually playing what's known as the op four, which is kind of like the bad guys. Now, how large of an involvement you have in this training exercise really just kind of depends on your MOS. Obviously, if you're someone like a finance individual, your role is very small. You're probably working out of a talk inside of a tent, doing some different operations or whatever. But if you're someone like an 11 Bravo or certain other MOSs, then yeah, you're pretty busy and you're pretty well involved in this training exercise. But regardless, you're doing whatever your MOS would be in a combat zone for this field problem or sometimes stuck on some you know crappy detail doing something else, maybe playing Op 4 if your job isn't that busy. So let's talk about kind of leading up to the field. So you know what you would expect if you were in a unit that was getting ready to go to the field you typically know quite a ways out when your unit is going to the field. They'll give everybody a heads up saying, hey, we're doing company sticks coming up in August, so you know, be prepared for that. You know, you're not gonna be taking leave, you can't take any vacation during that time frame because everybody needs to go to this and don't make any appointments for that time frame, even though sometimes people do and you have to try to accommodate that depending on if the appointment's important enough, but they usually give you some you know, ample amount of time ahead of time to know when this company sticks or this field problem is coming up. There have different tasks they kind of have to lead up to this training problem. You're gonna have to give vehicles ready, you have to get equipment ready, you have to pack up vehicles, you're going to have to probably have some kind of packing list for taking to the field. You're probably going to do layouts along with that. So they're going to give you this checklist of all of the TA-50, the army gear that you have, that you have to bring with you, and you're probably going to have some kind of layout prior to, to make sure everybody's got that equipment. They don't have lost anything important that they need, and make sure they have enough time to replace it before we go to the field. So you're laying everything out, probably the motor pool or back at your office area, somewhere along those lines, maybe in the barracks, laying out everything, and and your leadership, your non-commissioned officers are going through and you know calling off the items, you gotta hold them up, put them in your bag, whatever you're kinda doing, however the format is, to make sure that all the, probably like the E4 and belows have everything. Usually you're not checking on the NCOs, but that could still be a you know, process that some people do, but you wanna make sure that all the privates, the specialists, the whatever, you know, they have the equipment they need, so that way you don't get out of the field, and then it turns out that someone forgot their sleeping bag because they didn't pack it. So there's a lot leading up to it, you know, those layouts and you know getting everything ready, but then when it actually comes down to it, it usually involves being there super early in the morning when you probably don't need to be actually there at that early in the morning. Many, many times we'd get ready to go to the field and we had to be in the motor pool at like 
three in the morning, something ridiculous like that. But then we wouldn't leave until like 10 o'clock or noon or something like that. So a lot of that time you're, you know, sure you're prepping your vehicle, getting everything ready or whatever, you know, your transportation is to get out to that field environment. And then a lot of times you're just sitting around doing nothing, hanging out, eventually maybe do some kind of briefing as far as we're, Hey, we're getting ready to roll out in about an hour or whatever. And then maybe several hours later, finally taken off on this long process to get out of the field. If you're someone who is with vehicles, then usually you're convoying out. You probably have this huge long convoy of vehicles that are just following each other to get out to the training site that probably isn't super far away sometimes. Sometimes it is far away. Sometimes it's only like maybe 10 miles up the road, but it'll still take you like an hour to get there. Sometimes just for training purposes, you're gonna be doing some crazy circles and doing some crazy back roads, and then you only ended up maybe 10 miles down the road or whatever, just for the training purpose of the convoy. So there's a lot of different things that kind of tie into there. Sometimes you're doing that to convoy for training purposes to get to the training site, or sometimes you're just going straight there, but because you're in such a huge convoy, it takes a little bit of time to get there. Now, when you get out to the training site, you're getting out and you're setting everything up, but the kind of weird and kind of crazy part about that is it's not even really the same way as if you were in like Iraq or Afghanistan, because when you get to this training site, you have to set up like Constantina wire and tents and digging foxholes and you don't do any of that stuff when you're like in like an environment like Iraq or Afghanistan. But that'll kind of vary too. There are some units that may be set up in an area that's a little bit more similar to what you would do in Iraq and Afghanistan, where you're actually occupying an established base, a FOB or a combat outpost or something along those lines. For some infantry units, it's simply just, hey, we're gonna go out here to the middle of this field or whatever, and uh, you just kind of put your vehicles in a circle and that's where we're gonna be. And then that's kind of the end of it and you're kind of already done, you're ready. But for other units, you know, they have to set up like an actual FOB. You have to set up triple strand Constantino wire, start setting up tents, start setting up generators and starting up, setting up where the chow hall is going to be, start setting up where the ammo is going to be stored at, where the vehicle perimeters are going to be at, you know, for security, all sorts of other things that you don't actually usually do in Iraq or Afghanistan because you're usually falling in on pre-established bases or FOBs or combat outposts. So that's a lot of times the first day. You're setting everything up, getting everything ready, getting everything established, setting up tents, setting up where you're gonna be living. Sometimes you're living in your vehicle, sometimes you're living in tents, sometimes you might be lucky enough to have a field problem that has actual barracks at them. I've seen that sometimes too. And sometimes it just depends on your AMOS. Sometimes 11 Bravos, they're just sleeping next to a vehicle, sleeping in the dirt somewhere. That can really depend, but if you're a cook, you're probably sleeping in a tent. If you're a mechanic, sleeping in a tent. A lot of other AMOSs, it just really just depends on your AMOS and what you're doing. So you're essentially just kind of, you know, treating it like if you were in a combat environment, what you would do in a combat environment for your MOS. A lot of those clerical type of MOSs or ones that don't actually have like a, you know, combat type of role or logistics type of role, they're a lot of times working inside of a tent or a talk somewhere to do some kind of operations inside there. Now you're not usually doing PT while you're out there, you're usually just getting up early to start mission or to kind of get things going. And then you're working fairly late-ish, you know, and then going to sleep at a certain time and then, you know, getting up and starting all over again the next morning. Depending on how long your field problem is, you may or may not get weekends off, but even the times when you do have a situation where you're getting weekends off in the field, there are usually some people who still have to stay behind to guard the equipment. So sometimes there's, you know, a bunch of people that go back and then you'll have to, you know, have a guard shift or whatever. We have to report back during the weekend to go out for a couple hours to guard the ammo, guard the equipment or whatever, and then someone replaces you and you get to go back to enjoy the rest of the weekend. But sometimes that really varies on the unit and what's going on because there are also a lot of times where you don't get the weekends off while you're in the field and you just have to do it straight, you know, for however long that field problem is. But if the field problem does last more than 30 days, they have to pay the married soldiers separation pay. So typically most field problems don't go beyond 30 days. There are also some really short field problems they are only a couple days. It really just has all sorts of lengths. But like I said, that 30 day one is usually the max because they don't want to have to hassle with doing the paperwork for family separation for those married individuals. Now, when the field problem is finally all said and done, then you pack everything up, it sucks because you have to tear down all that Constantina wire, fill in those foxholes, tear down the tents, gather up all your equipment, repack it up. And it's probably a similar kind of process where maybe you got up early to do so, and then the convoy to leave to head back to the motor pool to get the vehicles back isn't until like maybe, you know, several, several hours later. Sometimes it lasts a while to where you don't get back until late at night. It just kind of varies sometimes. Most of the common ones I've done, we start pack up in the morning and then sometime later in the afternoon is when we actually start executing the movement back to the motor pool. But for individuals who have vehicles, usually you're stopping by the wash rack. You have probably a humongous line of everybody in your unit waiting to get through the wash rack that takes forever to finally get through that dang wash rack to get your vehicles rinsed off and washed off so that you're not going back to the motor pool and they're like dripping mud or dirt and getting the motor pool all dirty because Sergeant Major hates that. 
So you're taking the vehicles usually through the wash racks, hosing everything off, getting everything cleaned off, and then parking all the vehicles back in the motor pool, downloading equipment, and then maybe finally, you know, getting to a point where you're turning in weapons, turning in sensitive items like your MBGs or whatever, and then hopefully getting to go home at a decent time. But sometimes there are also times where you're finally done with all that process at like midnight, two in the morning, whatever the case might be. Sometimes it's planned to where like the last day of the field problem is maybe a Thursday and maybe a three day weekend after that, or maybe it's a Friday and you get the rest of just the normal weekend off. But you know, sometimes that varies. Sometimes, you know, you're coming back on a Tuesday and then you still have to come back the next day for PT. It just really kind of varies on how the unit plans the end of that training exercise. But after that's all said and done, then you still have some more stuff to do. You have what is called recovery of where you're probably doing another inventory to see if you've lost any equipment, to see uh, you know, the status of your vehicles, the status of all your other equipment that you brought out, like the tents and everything, getting them maybe hosed off and then folded back up and put back in a Connex or in a storage facility or whatever you, know, you store all your equipment at. So you have that recoverability kind of time frame for another like week or two after the field problem's over of just making sure everything is good from that exercise. And then maybe a month, maybe two months, whatever, depending on the units, there are some units that do this often and you're back in the field again. And then there's other units that maybe only do maybe a couple a year. It really just kind of varies on your location, the weather sometimes, the type of unit, all sorts of different factors that kind of determine how frequently you will do these training exercises. Now a question for any of my veterans out there, active duty army individuals, maybe leave some comments down below, maybe some stories about your favorite field problem that you maybe enjoyed the most or something you did during a field problem that you enjoyed the most, some kind of story that maybe kind of relates to a field problem, a field exercise that you can kind of, you know, share a story with. One of the big ones that kind of stand out to me, there's a lot of price stories that I probably have from field exercises because, you know, over 10 years I did a lot. But one of the big ones I think that stands out to me was one time I got put on a detail while I was in the National Training Center of having to man this trash point for like, I think it was half the day or something like that. And you had to make sure that people were throwing away food into the proper bins and recyclables into the proper bins when they came back from doing these log packs to bring food out to individuals that are in more remote locations. Well, a lot of times you, they'd bring back food that was already open opened and they can't do anything with it so they have to throw it away so maybe you'd have like a, a cake that only has like you know one slice taken out of it or you know some chocolate milk that has like maybe a couple of containers taken out of it but they have still some extra you know sealed chocolate milk you know containers still left and you could you know easily just snag that stuff and snack on it so you could totally just get fat sitting at that trash point when the log packs were coming back to throw away all their excess food and everything the army does waste a lot of food by the way but i remember that was pretty awesome because me and the other guy that was on that detail we ended up having a bunch of like juices and chocolate milk and cake and other little snacks and everything that you know these units were throwing away because they were stuff that were just excess from this you know chow run that they just got done doing well, all right if you enjoyed this video hit that thumbs up for me. I appreciate it. I got some recommendations over here, some other awesome videos. I think this one over here, I think if you watch that one, you might win a million dollars. I don't remember if that's the one or not, but check out the links down in the description for social media and all sorts of other stuff. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Christopher Chaos, and I'll see you next time. See ya.